Father God in heaven, in Jesus' name we come now, Lord, we honor you. Lord, we lift you, we magnify you, we thank you for being good and being God. Lord, we thank you for another chance to study your word. We thank you, Father, for your word, for your word is truth, your word is real, and your word delivers us. We pray, Father God, that you bless us as we come before you tonight. Father God, that your word will speak to us in a way like never before. Bless, Father God, your word, Father God, will be the truth that we will carry on for others to live by. Lord, bless us, Father God, tonight, dear Master, that your word, Father God, will be relevant to our situations. Lord, that we will walk with you and that we will carry it to other men, women, boys, and girls. And Lord, we ask you to keep the glory, all the honor and all the praise, Allow us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. It's in the strong, mighty, powerful, anointed name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen and thank God. Blessed Savior, He is worthy. He is worthy to be praised. Uh, tonight we are in the book of Jude. We begin tonight in the book of Jude. The book of Jude. If you would be kind enough, please share this video and share the videos to come. Share, please, ma'am, please share. Don't be too mean to share. Please share. Please share. This is another way that we do what we're called to do and witness before the Lord. Let's uh, share this video and share all those on Wednesdays and Sundays, if you would. The book of Jude is where we are tonight. We'll be looking at the first four verses, the book of Jude. The book of Jude, the, the book of Jude. It is the last book right before Revelation. In the back of your Bible, the book is Jude. If you remember, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John showed us that there were some things going on in the body of Christ that we were warned against. The Apostle John warned us against uh, false doctrine warn us against false teachers. And so Jude picks up where he left off and he introduces himself as a servant, a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ, a bond servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he, as John, warns the church one more time. He warns the church to make sure whatever you do, uh, contend for the faith. Verses one and two says, Jude, 
a bond servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James to those who are called sanctified by God, the father and preserved in Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace and love be multiplied to you. I want to want to give you a word tonight. You may want to write it down. We'll be talking about this word throughout the book of Jude. This word is called triad. T-R-I-A-D-S. Triads. T-R-I-A-D-S. Triad. As we walk through the book of Jude, you will find out that Jude uses a lot of triads. Anybody want to take a shot at what triads mean? Who, who've, who've Googled it already? <laughs> Anybody want to t tell me what triads? What do you think? Just off the top, off the top. It represents three. Anybody else? Triads, triads. Anybody? We have, we have it in music, and it's three notes played at the same time. Okay, three notes played at the same time in music. What is in the Bible? <laughs> triads, triads. Anybody else want to take a look at it? Take a stab at it? Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I haven't gotten to that yet, but you're right. It represents three three. It represents three. So throughout the writing of Jude, Jude will say something in sets of threes. Now, those who are superstitious says that death comes in threes. Y'all ever heard that? Death comes in threes. So what they do is they sit around and wait. After the first person died, they sit around and wait on the next two to fall out. Anybody in the house like this? Is there any truth to that? Then the truth. So has God situated stuff in your family where if one dies, two dies and three dies? Or is that superstition? That's superstition. So when you talk about triads, the, the author will do what we call in English uh, words in a series. So in order to have words in series, you need at least three or more. Right. So here a Jew talks about he speaks through triads. Can you look at verses one and two and tell me if you see any triads there? Do you see any triads in verses one and two? Where there are three points made to make one statement or made to make complete one thought. Can you see anything there? He says, Jude, a bond servant of Jesus Christ and brothers of James, brother of James. So we know that's only two, right? So it's not there in the first portion of verse one. Then he says to those who are called, comma, sanctified by God, the father, comma, and preserved in Jesus Christ. Anything there? That's a triad. It's a triad because number one, he identifies that he's writing to people who are number one call. Number two, sanctified by God, the father. And number three, preserved in Jesus Christ. So throughout the book of Jude, he will point out these triads. OK, verse number two. Do you see anything that even resembles a triad? He says, Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Yes? yes? What are they? Mercy, peace, and love. So here in just first, the first two verses, he points out to us two different triads. He points out to us two different triads. Now let me back up to verse one. Not only does he point out a triad in verse one, he also, as Sister Brown has said, he points out the trilogy. What is the trilogy? The trilogy, three also, right? And he also points out the triune God. Let's see. He says they are called. He says they are sanctified by the Father God. He's been preserved by Jesus Christ. And what he does not spell out is those who are called are called by the Holy Spirit. So he has called by the Holy Spirit. That's one sanctified by God, the father. That's two. And then he says 
that they are preserved by Jesus the Christ. They are preserved by Jesus the Christ. So he begins to talk about this in a triad formation, and he talks about warning Christians, even though he warns Christians who are in existence doing this writing, he's also warning Christians in the 21st century. Why is there a need? Why is there a need, Brother Whitlock, to warn Christians in the 21st century about false doctrine, about false teachers, about heresy? Why is there a need to warn us today? Or is there a need? Still going on, right? And the devil is raising his ugly head and he's making sure that people get so confused during this time that they fall away. The falling away from the truth is called apostasy. So Jude will address this word apostasy throughout his writing also. He's addressing apostasy. What has happened is that there are those who want people to fall away purposely. He, they, they have fallen away, so they want other folk to fall away. Misery loves, misery loves company. So because they have fallen away, because they don't want to believe, because they don't want to operate in truth, guess what happens? They want other people to follow them. Have you ever had somebody in your life who, if they get mad at somebody, they want you to get mad at them? If, you stop deal, if they stop dealing with somebody, they want you to stop dealing with them? If you stop playing with them or having fun with them or hanging out with them, if they stop it, they want you to stop it. Isn't that something? So there are some, even in the body of Christ, there are some that have even snuck into the church that want other folk to fall away from God. So he says he's writing this letter to those who are called. This word call means that they've been touched by the Holy Spirit. This word call means that they've been delivered. They've been set aside. They have been deemed righteous. Are we righteous because we just good folk? We're only righteous because Christ has made us righteous. He has deemed us righteous. He has imputed righteousness to us. There's not one that's righteous. No, not one. But it's only through Christ, the righteous one, that we are righteous. So we are called. We are the call. We are those who have been called. If you notice, Jew doesn't even talk about his apostleship. He doesn't talk about his education. He doesn't talk about who he is in the church. He just basically says... I am a servant. I'm a bond servant of Jesus Christ. He says, I am a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Jesus says, the greatest is the servant. Are you serving? Should you be serving? Or do you care to be a servant? He says, I'm a bond servant of Jesus Christ. And then he identifies himself as the brother of James. He didn't say he was the brother of Jesus, did he? But he did say he's the brother of James. You see, if I say I'm the brother of Jesus, then that gives me some credence. That, that, that gives me some authority. But he says, I'm Jude, I'm a servant, and my brother it's James. I'm sure you all have heard this before. When I was in college and then Levon came later, I lost my identity. Because Levon was the boy that could stand flat footed as a freshman and throw a ball 70 yards and hit this target every time. I couldn't do that. A football, that is. I couldn't do that. And everybody in the school knew I couldn't do it. So when he showed up, I became Matthew Levon's brother. I mean, I totally, I mean, for two years, I had an identity. For two years, I was Matthew, the guy in the electronics department. But when Levon showed up, now I'm Matthew Levon's brother. 
that's the only credence I had. That was the only, that was the only ship I was sailing because of Levon. And so it would be me walking down the sidewalk with a bunch of guys and they would just call my name Matthew Levon's brother. So, so Jude, Jude doesn't say he's the brother of Jesus. There are three different thoughts when you look at Jude. Uh, this word Jude is short for Judas. Not to be confused with Judas Iscariot. What did Judas Iscariot do? Judas Iscariot. What did he do? He sold Jesus out for a few corns, right? So, Jude is short for Judas, but many believe that there are three different Jews at this time and theologians still have not decided which one it was. So we'll address him as Jude, the writer of the book of Jude. We're safe there. Because guess what? I wasn't there. <laughs> Were you there? <laughs> so he is the writer of the book of Jude. He says he's writing this book to those who are called. He says he's writing this book to those who are sanctified by God, the Father. He says he's writing this book to those who are preserved by Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ. So let's look at that. This word call reflects the fact that he's talking in the past. This word call means that these are the elect that now have salvation. So he deals with those from the past. It, it deals with the fact that something in the past have happened to you that is different from others. You've been called. Preachers like to say, I've been called out to be picked upon. So what are they saying there, Sister Wood? I've been called out to be picked upon. What, what are they saying? I've been called out. To be picked up on. What they're really saying is because I've been called by God, now folk pick on me. <laughs> been called out to be. So, so Jude writes this letter to those who were called by the Father. Then he says, those who are sanctified by God, called out by the Holy Spirit, sanctified by God the Father. They're called by the Holy Spirit, sanctified by God the Father. This represents the present. They, are, they have been sanctified. They have been purified. They have become holy because of God the Father. They're not holy in themselves. This indicates that God's love was manifested unto them. So much until he sanctified them. Are you sanctified? Now, you don't have to go to a sanctified church to be sanctified. Boy, did we have it wrong. We thought when you go to the sanctified church, you run around the room, you run into the wall, you get high and, and you jump and roll in the aisles. We thought if you went to the sanctified church, you were only sanctified through the sanctified church. And we thought you had to speak in tongues to be sanctified. Is that true? Yes? Is that true? Anybody? No. Boy, did we have it wrong. I'm telling you, we used to go to sanctified church and look through the window because we were scared to go in because we thought the Holy Spirit would make us act like that. But what we didn't realize is that every church ought to respond to the movement of the Holy Spirit. Every church member ought to respond to how God moves in the service. Matter of fact, every person ought to respond how God move at your house, in your car. You don't have to wait till you get to church. You ought to celebrate the goodness of God because you are called and you are sanctified. Are you called? Are you sanctified? So we, we are called by way of the Holy Spirit. We are sanctified because of God himself. We are sanctified. And then he says, not only are we sanctified, we are preserved. We are preserved. 
we are preserved. That means we are kept by Jesus Christ himself. Let me tell you, when you are saved, when you are born again, when you are a Christian, regardless of how much you read your Bible, only Jesus Christ can keep you. You can't keep yourself. Because if you were trying to keep yourself, guess what would happen? You would cuss every person out that make you upset. Not that you're not cussing now, but you would cuss all of them out then. <laughs> not just one or two a week. You cuss them all out. You'll be fired every week. You would be fired every week. Because how many of your bosses have made you mad enough just to tell him something? Oh, all y'all good Christian folk, you know. <laughs> I mean, but if you if you weren't kept by Jesus, if Jesus wouldn't hold your tongue, your neighbors, your boss. Your children. I mean, you've heard people in the, in the store just cuss their children. I mean, cuss their children like seaport sailors. And you know, folk, some folk, don't have, don't, they don't need any children. Lady this week just killed her daughter. And when she got through stabbing her, she took a bag and put it over her head. Did she need any children? No. And then told the police, I did it and I did it on purpose. I was intending to do it. Then she drove the baby to the to the uh, emergency room, went inside and told the nurses, look, I killed my child. She out there in the car. You know that people like that don't need. I mean, there had to be some signs somewhere. There were already signs because the daddy had had custody. So there were some signs there. Well, we have to understand if Jesus does not preserve us, if Jesus does not keep us, we are kept by Jesus. This expressed the assurance regarding the future. Jesus kept me. Jesus kept me. No one could keep me but Jesus. I had, I had and I have so much respect for my parents. I used to be scared and probably still is today if I was going to do the fool, be scared to act a fool because I thought it was going to get back to them. But guess what? I ought to be more concerned about Jesus than I am about my parents. And my parents scaring me or disciplining me could not keep me. It's only through Jesus that I'm kept. Are you with me? Because we can sneak and do some things and parents don't find out about it. I mean, we you, you ever seen girls and boys that their parents just think they're they're lily white, that they just stepped out of the clouds and they never done anything wrong. But when you see them. <laughs> people, people used to say the preachers and the deacons children are the worst ones. But the preachers and the deacons thought their children were the best ones. It's, if you're going to be kept, you're going to have to be kept by Jesus. You have to be kept by Jesus. He says, verse two, mercy unto you. He says mercy. He says mercy unto you. Every living being needs mercy in this messed up world we're in. We live in a wicked world. We live in a shameless world. And we live in a world that is immoral. Did you catch the triad? Any triads you catch? You catch any triads? And believe it or not, we speak on a regular basis in triads. We speak in one, two, and three. And we do it on a regular basis. We do it on a regular basis and we don't even know it. So we need to understand that the divine provisions that Jesus has made for us. One is mercy. One is peace and one is love. God's mercy sustains us in times of disgust. In times of difficulties. 
and in times of danger. God's mercy keeps us. We don't get the bad that we deserve. That's mercy. God's mercy. If I just think about some of the things I've done and I'm still living. It's only by God's mercy. <laughs> Who is only by God's mercy. And, and, and one thing I have in my mind now, all eight of us should have died right there on the spot. Now, you think about what you've done, not about what the eight of us did. They should have found all eight of us on the side of the road dead. But God's mercy. He kept he kept us through his mercy. Can you think of just one thing that you deserve to be dead because of just one thing? See, I, I know you may have been Mr. and Mrs. Goody Two Shoe. But guess what? It's God's mercy. And check this out. God is such a great God until he allows us to keep living and then he hide it from other folk. That's mercy. The late pastor Evie Hill said that he was he was passing a church in California. And what happened is he moved from Mount Corinth here in Houston and moved to the church in California. And then um, Pastor A.L. Patterson moved from that same church in California and moved here to Mount Corinth. So it was just like a swap. And he said he was sitting there in church one Sunday and this woman walked down the aisle doing the invitation. He he gave the invitation. And, you know, used to be in church where a person come come down the aisle doing the invitation. They can get the mic and say anything they want to say. That doesn't happen anymore. Pastors got smart enough to shut that down. <laughs> I mean, people used to walk down the aisle, even in the 80s and 90s. They would walk down the aisle and the pastor would give them the mic for a testimony without interviewing them. Let me just make it known at the New Beginning Church, you got to have a full fledged interview before you give your testimony. Because once it's said, it's said, whether it's right, whether it's wrong, whether it's true or whether it's false. <laughs> once it's said, it's said. So 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 Dr. Hill tells the story and he says one day he was he was at church and he saw this woman sitting in the audience. And he recognized her and she had something against him. And what she had against him was true. And he thought, man, I hope this woman didn't get up this morning. <laughs> sure enough, he's sitting, he gets up, he preaches, he opens the doors of the church, gives the invitation. Guess who walked down the aisle? This woman who has something against him. And when she walked down the aisle, he didn't just stand and continue to extend his hand for the invitation. He said he sit back down. And then that time they had the big old pulpit with the high chair, then the two small chairs then two smaller chairs. You know, he said, he sit back down behind the pulpit. And he said to the Lord, Lord, blot it out. Lord, blot it out. Lord, blot it out. And you have to know Dr. Hill to know how he screams and holler. Lord, blot it out. So he gives this woman the mic and he just begged the Lord to blot it out. And she gets up and she prays him for all the great work that he's doing in the community and all the dynamic preaching that he's done. He sits back down. He said, Lord, thank you. Lord, thank you. Lord, thank you. She he said she could have killed him right there because she was right. But he allowed God. He begged God. He asked God to intervene and God was faithful and gave him mercy. So if you hear me hollering sometime, Lord, blot it out. Blot it out, Lord, blot it out. And it doesn't have to be a person that's threatening. It's just the fact that God's mercy keeps us. Some writer said, I almost let go. I almost let go, but his mercy, his mercy kept me. Then, then, then Jude says, peace. 
He, he, gives, he gives us, God gives us peace. Only God can give us peace. God's peace can give us a calmness when evil abounds. Only God's peace can give us a calmness. I've used this example several times. When you see a duck on water, the duck just looks like he's just gliding. Look like he's just doing things so effortless. He just, the duck is just gliding across the water. It's such a beautiful sight. But if you look down under the water, <laughs> that duck is pedaling like 100 miles an hour just to glide on top of the water. That's how peace is. In the midst of the storm, God gives us peace. In the midst of trouble, God gives us calmness. In the midst of contention, God makes us strong. And we look like we're calm because we are. Only God, the Father, only God, the Holy Spirit, only God, the Son, can give us calmness, give us peace. I've said to you several times, the fact of the matter is, sometimes God calms the storm while his child is in the storm. See, all of us want to look at Mark chapter four and say, God, Jesus stood up and said, peace be still. And my winds and my waves laid down and slept like a baby. But how many times you've been through a storm and, and the storm just kept on coming, just kept on coming. The songwriter said, if this storm don't cease, my soul is anchored in the Lord. If these mountains, if this water doesn't keep rising and look like I'm drowning, my soul is anchored in the Lord. See, sometimes God calms the storm. When the child is in the storm, he calms the storm. But other times he calms his child in the midst of the storm. I mean, all trouble and wickedness can be taking place around you and you just as calm. You, you just as cool. You just one who just kind of got glide like that duck on top of the water. But there's a storm going on all around you. God gives us peace in the midst of a storm. See, we need the peace of God. But in order to have the peace of God, we need to have peace with God. We want the peace of God. But in order to have the peace of God, we got to have the peace with God. And we have peace with God when we're saved, we're born again. The fighting that was going on between us and God comes to a happy ending with Jesus Christ. That's what happened on Calvary. Jesus reached up and caught the hand of a holy God, reached down and caught the hand of an unholy man and brought this bitter dispute to a happy ending on the cross. You got to have peace with God in order to have the peace of God. People who are successful, who don't have God, they don't have peace with God. They may think they have peace, but it's temporary. But let me tell you, when you have peace with God, when you made peace with God, then you can have the peace of God. You can be calm in the midst of the storm. And then it talks about, he says, love. God's love can protect us. God's love gives the believer the assurance in the face of danger. Remember, it's dangerous to live a Christian life at the time of this writing. And so in the midst of danger, God's love gives us assurance that everything going to be all right in the midst of danger, in the midst of threats and in the midst of risk. 
it's going to be all right. It's, it's going to be all right. It's, it's good. It's all good. So you, you can, because of God's love, you can have peace. And because it's pe- you have the peace because you know he's been merciful. Who wouldn't serve a God like that? And he is the awesome, the amazing God. Let's look at verses number three through four. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend honestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saint. Look at what he says. He says, I was very diligent to write to you. He says, I was so diligent. In other words, I was wishing to write to you. He says, I was hasting to write to you. He says, I was eager to write to you. He said, regardless, I was going to write to you, but I was eager to write to you. I was hastening to write to you. I was wishing to write to you. I was diligent to write to you concerning our common things, the theme of salvation. He said, I was going to write to you and rejoice with you. I was going to write to you and assure you of your salvation. I was going to write to you to to talk about salvation, concerning salvation, and this theme of salvation, but because of the atmosphere, then I need to talk to you about something else. Have you ever noticed that sometimes pastors are on themes? I know you've noticed here. You're preaching from a particular theme or a particular book, and all of a sudden something happens in the news, and then next Sunday... He's no longer talking about that. Now we got to talk about this here lately. I've been talking more about school shootings, safety, children being where they need to be at the time they need to be there about telling it. If you hear it, been talking more about praying for our youth and our young people. Why? Sister Whitlock, why? Why now? Why am I talking about that now? Am I just. It's in the news, right? It's all around us. It's all it's plaguing us. It's bombarding us. Innocent children dying off of foolishness. Children making stupid decisions. I don't know how that interprets in Spanish, but that's and I don't know any other way to say it. They're making decisions that just don't make sense. And everybody blaming everything on mental illness. Yeah, you mentally ill. That's for sure. But so 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 he says, beloved, while I was very interested and diligent to writing to you concerning common salvation, I found it necessary. He says, I wanted to talk to you about the things that we rejoice about, but I found it necessary. In other words, Jude was forced to talk concerning the urgent things and the detestable things in life. So what purpose we preach if we don't preach and teach based on pulling people out the pit? What is this called? Pulpit, right? Have you ever wondered why it's called a pulpit? This may not be the right definition. You may not find this when you Google it, okay? But have you ever thought about why this is called a pulpit? Because the preacher has been given the assignment to pull the people who are in front of him out of the pit. That's why it's imperative for the preacher to go get training on how to pull people out of the pit. And not only that, That's why it's imperative for the preacher to sit in the audience sometimes so he can be pulled out of the pit. Yes. Y'all know any preachers that need to be pulled out of the pit at least every now and then. It's a poor pit. And every now and then we all find ourselves in the pit. 
And it becomes the man of God's responsibility to pull those who are suffering out of the pit. So he says, I wanted to write to you about salvation. I wanted to rejoice with you. I want to talk so so eloquent to you about being saved and what God has done for you. And this word salvation here means your deliverance. Man, I wanted to talk about your deliverance, your safety. I wanted to talk about how you've been rescued from the devil, but the devil is still busy. The devil is still on his job. And because the devil is still on his job, I had to stop my penmanship to focus on these jokers who are giving out false doctrine. I told you, Paul says, beware of Alexander the carpet smith, for he did me great harm in ministry. He goes on to say, mark that man. J- J- uh, John closed out John chapter J- third John. John closed out third John by talking about a fella that was upsetting the church. He called him by name. And then he says, when I get there, I'll tell you more about him. He warned them. That's why I always say you don't let somebody come to your house and tear your house up. You don't let somebody come in and infiltrate the house with false doctrine. And let me just say it while I'm here. If you got somebody that comes to you talking something against what we're teaching, tell them to come to me. I can really talk to them. I'll be glad to. And we've had several preachers come through here that that felt like they had the answer. And it's okay to have the answer. It's good you have the answer. But the fact of the matter is, I'm the one, as 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 Jude says, I'm the one who has been called to this location, to this body of people for such a time as this. And I will never, ever, ever shuck my responsibilities. So if any questions come up, if somebody teaching something that I'm not teaching, tell them to come. Let's talk about it. Because whether you realize it or not, I'm ultimately responsible for what goes on in the atmosphere here at the New Beginning Church. Hmm. Isn't that something? In 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 a season where people don't want to take on responsibility, I'm saying to you, I take on that responsibility. I didn't want to preach and I certainly didn't want to pastor. If I had had a choice, then I wouldn't do it. But since I'm in it, I got to do the best I can with it. And now I love it. The responsibility is on me. You don't even have to fight it. Send them to me. And if I don't know the answer, I can find it out. Amen. I still ask questions. I still go to school. I still uh, sit and ask, uh, what about this? I mean, simple things that you would think is simple in the Bible. I'm still asking questions about because I'm ultimately responsible. I've been called. <laughs> Jude said, you've been called. You, you've been selected. You're the one that's chosen. Now, in a few years from now. A few days from now, a few minutes from now, if God chooses something else, then that's his responsibility. But for this day and this age, I take full responsibility. And I love it. I love it. I get joy out of it. I'd rather not do any other thing than pastor the New Beginning Church. Regardless of the numbers that show up on Sunday, the numbers that show up on Wednesday, I wouldn't want to do anything else. That's the difference in being called and went. Some were called, some were sent, and some just went. You see, when trouble strikes, you can tell who's been called. (laughs) Because those who've been called, they just grit their teeth and get with it. So he says we'll call. He says that we we have to make sure that we understand that he was about to write a good love story about the story of salvation. But you and that's another thing. You can't always preach a a joyous message from the pulpit. You brothers can't always teach 
a joyous message in Sunday school Bible study. Sooner or later, you're going to have to ruffle some feathers. Sooner or later, you're going to have to say, no, you're doing the wrong thing. Sooner or later, you're going to have to say, no, that ain't what the word says. One of your students is going to charge you up. And you're going to have to say, no, that's not biblical. That's not, that's not what it says. So, but you, you're called to do it. You, you're selected by God to do it. So Jude had an emergency situation. And when you got an emergency, you stop everything you're doing and you address the emergency. Someone gets sick at your house. It doesn't matter what was on the agenda for the day. If they're sick enough to go to the emergency room, you call your appointment and say, I just can't make it today. <laughs> I, can't, I can't make it today because I have an emergency. So he he addresses the emergency at hand and the emergency is at hand is false doctrine. So I wanted to write these good things to you, but I, I, I couldn't do it. Uh, I wanted to talk about the common salvation. I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. Now he's saying it was, it was once for all delivered. In other words, Jesus died once on Calvary and he died for all and there's no more death needed for the salvation of mankind because Jesus has already done it. He died once for all. He died once for all. And, and he says, I want to remind you to contend for the faith. Contend for the faith. He means you're going to have to struggle for this faith. Because there are so many things out there and there are new things popping up every single day. You got to struggle for it. You have to live according to the word of God and don't bend under pressure. Don't bend under pressure. Preacher was telling me, he said, man, you know, the people got on me for preaching certain things. I said, well, was it in the Bible? Yeah. Did you, was it extra biblical? No. Was it what the Bible said? Yes. Well, what you going to do? Are you preaching for the people to please them? Or are you preaching because God has called you and you're preaching to please him? This thing must be struggled in the midst of it. You must be willing to live for the word of God and you must not change or bend under pressure. There are some things out there on a regular basis that comes up every day that people saying, oh, you, you got to be you got to be brought up to the 21st century. Don't you know that God wrote the Bible with the 21st century in mind? And when he wrote it, according to the 21st century, as well as the first century, he captured all of it because he's an all knowing God. He knows everything. He sees everything. Preacher told me, oh, man, you as things change, you got to change. Well, the change must be transformed and communicated through the word of God. Any day you find me. Pleasing the people in my preaching and not pleasing God's word and God himself, then you know I've lost my mind. That is mental illness. That is mental illness. I said to a preacher, I said, he said, man, you know, when I go to my dad at church, I can't talk about this, but I talk about it here. When I go to my dad at church, I can't let this happen there, but I let this happen here. I said, well, you need to make your mind up. The same preacher told me, man, I don't know how I'm going to preach today because uh, Michael Jackson died. I said, you need to turn your license in. I said, call your pastor now and tell him he can have these back because you're not called. If Michael Jackson's death bothered you that much, don't you know that Jesus died? And that's what you ought to be concerned about. I said, man, what you need to do is call your pastor. Say, look, meet me here. I need to give you this. And then go on back to the word and do what you're going to do. Be an apostate. <laughs> Walk away. But if you're going to stick with the word, preach the word, and we all miss it sometime, but stick with it and get more of it. Then you have you have certain people that say, uh, I'm just going to preach what God gives me. Well, if you're not studying, God is not giving you anything. 
And then they say stuff like, well, seminary is just cemetery. And I said, you dumb Terry, too. I'm going to be original or nothing. So he turns out being both originally nothing. Well, we have to understand this is ever learning. God is looking for us to contend for the faith, defend this faith. The word faith is your convictions, your assurance and your truth, your conviction, your assurance, your truth. When the preacher stands, he's only preaching. When the teacher stands, he or she are only preaching and teaching their convictions. You know, we, get, we have Sunday school books, right? And sometimes Sunday school books have those commentaries in there. And I thank God for, for, for Brother Whitlock. I thank God for Brother Miles because they are sharp enough to know this does not apply to the word of God. Have y'all ever seen them skip over stuff? Have you ever seen them this story here? We ain't reading that this story this day. Am I right? So it's only because you have to teach according to truth, teach according to assurance and teach according to your convictions, because there is false doctrine out here. And everybody who's writing is not writing according to the word. Jude says, contend for the faith. He says, fight for it. He says, struggle for it. He says, be assured that what God has put in you is the right thing. We all ought to grow. We all ought to become better. But God has put the very basics in us. And a lot of times we, we're, we're excited about new stuff and a rhema word, but we don't even have the basics. Let's just get the basics. He says, defend the faith, contend for the faith. Then he proceeded to tell his readers that you ought to be concerned about these things. Godly men have snuck in on the way. He said these same truth have delivered us once for all to the saints. Then he says in verse four, and I'll leave you alone. He says, for certain men have crept in unnoticed. They have crept in unaware. They have crept in without announcing themselves. One guy says, one, a preacher had preached for 35 years and about after year 35, he got saved. He preached for 35 years and on the 35th year he got saved. There are men and women and children who look saved, who act saved. They know when to say hallelujah. They know when to clap. They know when to stand. They know when to sit down. But the Bible says some of them have snuck in unaware, unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for condemnation. Ungodly men who turn the grace of God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Whenever one denies the word of God, denies the Lord himself, whenever one denies the very embodiment in the coming of Jesus Christ, as John told us in first John, second John and third John, when they deny Christ and how he has already come, then they are not of God. He says that ungodly men have snuck in. They've snuck in unaware. They have snuck in unnoticed. They looked the part. They even act the part. They even carry themselves as a part. But guess what? They are not the part. They are not of God. He says, be aware for ungodly men have snuck in on aware who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly men who turned the grace of our God into lewdness. They have taken the grace of God and denied the power thereof. They don't even understand the authority of God. And they always want to be teachers. So many people have joined our church and said, look, I wanted to, I, I taught Sunday school at that other church. And I'm like, well, why did the pastor run you away? Why did the pastor ask you to leave? And then you got guys that run from one place to the other and then they get here and they want to do these things. The Bible says, examine them. Check them out. Listen to them. 
watch them because there are men who have snuck in unaware, unnoticed, and they carry this false doctrine. And they want everybody to bow to them. They are apostate. They are pulling people away from the church. Oh, the, the COVID-19 has given people a good way out now. They got family reunions they go to. They got parties they go to. They got beaches they go to. They got restaurants they go to. But oh, COVID is still alive at the church as if we're manufacturing COVID-19 at the church. They got all these places they're going. And security is having to put them out because there's too many people in the room. But when it comes to the church, we, we still got six feet separated rows. And you can sit in and where you want to sit. God is going to judge us. And he's going to judge us on how we contend for the faith. Jesus died for us to be able to to speak our conviction, to live our conviction and to live the truth. That same Jesus that died made a way out of no way. And that same Jesus that died and rose from the dead, that same Jesus is going to judge the quick and the dead. He's going to judge the living and the dead. He's going to judge all of us. The same Jesus is coming back again. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. You can trust Jesus tonight to be your savior and to be your Lord. You just have to try him. After trying him, after trying her, after trying them, it's time now to try Jesus. If you've never tried him, just bow your head with me and invite him into your life. Just repeat this simple prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus name, amen. amen. We believe if you prayed this prayer, you're now born again and, and you're on your way to heaven. We believe that you're saved. We believe that you're called out. We believe that you're sanctified. We believe that you ought to be in a good Bible teaching church in person. If you want to choose a church, we, I recommend the New Beginning Church, 4251 Sheremy Road, Houston, Texas, where Jesus is the center of attention and the main attraction. Please let us know if you received Christ tonight. Please let us know if you want to be a member of this church. Thank you so much for joining us. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for all that you do. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us, Father God, that we will contend for the faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. If you want to give to our ministry, you can do so by Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. If you want to give by way of mail, you can send your gifts to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. That's P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Again, thank you for joining us. Thank you for being a part of this service. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer. Amen.